All right. <clears throat> so you got your notes? All right. Tag along with me then. Uh, we're not going to get into details too much. I'm going to go back and pick up verse 7 and look at redemption a little bit, but I'm going to go broader picture. Um, there's some things that I was going to wait and talk about. Um, I decided to cover them now. Sort of just, you know, follow the text and then follow as the Lord leads me through the text. So there's just some things that I wanted to look at tonight. I'm not in too much of a hurry either, so... <clears throat> but I won't go all night either. So we're going to look at big picture. I want to talk about the union with Christ and what that signifies, especially when it comes to Ephesians. And this is really the book that got me started. We've looked at much of that when we looked at Colossians, but there's a lot of things that come out of Ephesians that we need to see and understand. We scratched the surface, but I wanted to go back and look a little bit more fully at what, what do we mean when we talk about the doctrine of the union of Christ. So you have all the notes there, the diagrams, you don't have all those. It's a little tough transforming them from uh, PowerPoint to hard copy, but nonetheless you can follow along. And some of these stuff you already have in, in past notes we managed to do. But just to remind you, Paul starts off with doxology in 1, 3 through 14. He begins his prayer in 115. And I'm going to tell you, this is important. So when you look at with me in chapter 1, verse 15, he says, For this reason I too, having heard of the faith of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, which exists among you, and your love for all the saints, do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers. So this is Paul's typical movement as he would go from salutation to thanksgiving, but in between we have verses 3 through 14, this doxology. But what I wanted you to see was when he gets to this issue of prayer, I want you to look at what he states in verse 17. He says that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Him. Okay? So this is flowing out of 1, 3 through 14. So 1, 3 through 14, he talks about all of the, the blessings that he's blessed us with, right? And not being comprehensive, it's not every single thing he's given us, but he gives us a general idea. But he flows out of that into this prayer, and his prayer is that we would grow in our knowledge of Him. Not merely just in the knowledge of these things as they pertain to us, but our knowledge of Him. And he's going to carry on this prayer then into chapter 2. He's going to pick it up again in chapter 3, verse 1. He's going to conclude in chapter 3, verse 14. And then he's going to tie it all together in chapter 3, verses 20 through 21 with his doxology. This whole entire section is worship. And we looked before on all the different phrases that Paul uses in the first three chapters. Everything about it is worshipful. And really it is where we find these run-on sentences. There's eight of them. Several of them are in the context of the prayer and celebration or praise in regards to what God has done. So just keep this in mind. But I just remind you, it's all about Him. So this isn't in your diagram, okay? But you just start reading through the letter. And this is just fragmentary. These are just some thoughts that, that come just from the few, few, few first chapters. But it runs through this entire letter. When we walk through this, we see that Paul's focus is on God. So even though we're looking at the fact that he chose us and he predestined us and we have redemption, it's all about God. I mean, and it isn't that it doesn't involve us, but sometimes we forget it's really about him ultimately. So when we walk through this section, it's his choice. It's His grace, it's His glory, it's His power, it's His will. And I go back to the power. He picks up from the statement of power in the end of chapter 1, verse 19. He talks about that power exercised in Christ when He raised Him from the dead. He carries that into chapter 2. And He says, and you also, verse 2, verse 1 of chapter 2, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins. He is going to carry on and give another example of this power of God. Well, this is what He did in your life. So this is important when you think about this, coming into this section. As much as he's talking about in chapter 2, what we once were, then two, two voices, but God, what God did in our life. As much as he talks about who we were and the transformation that happened, it's still about God. So here's a practical thing, right? So I wanted to try and be a little more tangible tonight. 
in the things that we talk about. So let's bring this into our prayer life, okay? If the focus is on God and His power here, then it's on His omnipotence, not our impotence. In other words, He's not focusing solely on this is how impotent we are. We're sinners, we're dead, and all this stuff. He does that so that we can see how powerful He is. Okay? So then bring that thought into our prayer life. How often do we pray? When we look at our situations, we know that we're weak. We know that we're frail. We know these things that are going on, life and death situations, all these things. We focus on those things rather than on the attributes of God. So we talk about, I can't do this, we need this, we need that, we need what. And it's not to say we can't bring those needs to God. That's the beauty of the fact that we can go to God and bring our needs to Him. But how often do we preface all of that first with the attributes of God? God, you are so amazing. You are so omnipotent. You are so honest. You are sovereign, right? And recognizing who He is and then come and lay our requests before Him. And even after that, do we go back and just dwell on who God is? Right? Because a lot of times, if you read through the psalm, when David prays, he's praying and asking God to respond out of his being, of who, is, who, he, who he is, his nature, his attributes, and those kinds of things. But so often, we get so focused on us and what we're dealing with and how we can't handle this that we forget it's about God and really what can he handle. And so all the way through this, this first few sections of this letter, and all the way through the letter, it's all about God. It's His will, it's His good pleasure, it's His purpose that's being worked out. We have to remember this. And I'll just say, you know, when we think about walking through these first three chapters, Paul's helping us understand what we are supposed to believe. We behave what we believe. So there is some truth to the statement, as a man thinketh, so is he. Because we act on what we believe, what we know, right? But far too often, the things that shape the way that we think are not the things of God's Word, it's the things of the world. So in Romans 12, Paul talks about the fact, he says, if I can put it in more pedestrian terminology, stop allowing the world to form you into its mold, compress you into its mold. But he says, he goes on to say, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Right? So the way that we live our life begins with how we think and what we believe, and then we live that out in our life. So here's an example. If I believe that God is truly sovereign, then I'm going to live like He's sovereign. If I believe that God is in total control of everything, then I'm going to live that way. So, to be a little more tangible then, say I'm taking a road trip somewhere, and I know the tires of my car are bald, and I know that I know, need new tires, but I also know that God knows I need those tires. I also know that God provides for my needs, and I trust in Him for that. Well, what if God doesn't provide for that need? And then sometimes when he does that, he's trying to tell me, you know what, you don't take that trip. Other times, he makes it very clear, I still need to take that trip, but I still have to trust him that he is in control of everything. So therefore, he is going to sustain the rubber. He's going to sustain the friction and the forces at work. He's going to sustain that car. He's going to get me where he wants me to go and bring me back. And if the tires blow on the way, then that's a part of his design. He intended that to happen. So this is where we start getting tangible with the things that we believe. If we believe these things about God, we understand that God has this purpose that He is working out. It involves everything, everything, even the most seemingly mundane things in life, right? So bring it into other areas of our life. We can pray for life. We can pray for health. We can pray for all these other things. We also have to be willing to accept if God says, I'm not going to give you what you're asking for, I'm going to give you something else because I have intended purposes for you, right? There is a will and a purpose behind everything that God is doing. And it doesn't always involve the things that we ask Him for. Sometimes the answer from Him is going to be, no, I'm not giving you that because I have another design. And the truth then is we have to be willing to, if we understand that God is sovereign, that God is good, that He has His purpose, He's working it out, and involves everything, 
and it's ultimately for our good, then whatever the answer is, we must embrace it just as much as if he gave us what we were asking for. But we don't do that usually. Usually we're, we're thank you God, that's awesome when he gives us what we ask him for, but when he doesn't do that, sometimes we're like, why, right? And we complain and moan. And it doesn't mean that it's not going to be hard at times, but just to say, these are tangible ways in which we live out what we believe. If we truly believe these things about God, then we need to behave them. So all the way through here, we are seeing things that it, it, it focuses on God. All this has to do with God. This is everything that He is doing in and through our lives. But it's about Him. It's about Him. So although we look at the details of these things, adoption and, and all of that, and the blessings that we receive, we just need to remember they're all His. This also brings the assurance. I mean, sometimes we get sort of worried and shaky in our faith, right? And, and you start to, to wonder and doubt. But here's the great thing. All of this stuff is rooted in Him. That's my stability. That's my strength. It's not in me. It's in the fact that everything is His. Right? And so Paul can say to the church of Philippi, He who began a good work in you, He will be faithful to complete it. He'll bring it to its conclusion. Same thing in 1 Corinthians. As, as bad as that church was, he was affirming that God confirmed the, the gospel in him and that he was going to confirm them in the end, regardless of all the stuff that had to be dealt with. So we started looking at this, and I, I want to give you this big picture. We're going to look at this tonight, talk about the union with Christ. This statement in Christ is such a a key phrase that, that runs through this letter. It's in Colossians as well, but so much in, in Ephesians. O over 30 times we have this phrase or like phrases like it. So this is saturated in this letter, and this is really what, what got me thinking about it. But it's such a... So this is how I render it, the prepositional phrase, in the sphere of Christ, because there's so much involved in it. Even when we talk about the union of Christ, we're going to see it's even broader than that. It has to encompass so many diff different things, and so it's such a, a broad thing. But in the sphere of Christ, this denotes our position. It defines our privileges. In the sphere of Christ, describes our possessions, and it determines our practice. In other words, this embraces everything in our life. And this isn't in your notes, so you have to, <laughs> you'll have to write this down. So in the sphere of Christ, it denotes our position. And these are truths that Paul folds out in this letter. So this is a comprehensive look at Ephesians. It defines our privileges, the fact that we're in Christ as opposed to outside of Christ. Colossians chapter 2, he talks about the fact that the fullness of deity dwells in him. And then in chapter 2, verse 10 of, of Colossians, he says, And in him we stand in the state of being made full. So when I read that, I always refer, refer to the words of uh, Jean-Paul Sartre. He said that life was like an empty bubble floating on the sea of nothingness. That's a true statement for an unbeliever. But in Christ, we are made complete. We stand in a state of completeness. We have everything that we need in regards to life. So this is such an, a comprehensive expression. So it denotes our position. Where he is, we are. If he's seated at the right hand of God the Father, chapter 2, that's exactly where we are. Exactly where we are. And I'll just say to you, that sometimes with these things we wrestle with, these kinds of statements. And, and sometimes it's because they scare us. But a lot of times it's because they just don't fit our concept of reality. So I was listening to a guy talk one time, and he was talking about Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3. And he was talking about the fact that how he was trying to figure out how those chapters of Genesis fit into his concept of reality. And I said, but there's his problem right there. It's his concept of reality. He's trying to make the Bible fit into that. In other words, that's the standard of measure, what he thinks reality is. The problem is, is that he needs to scrap his concept of reality and embrace God's concept of reality. So whatever God says is true and real, that's what's true and real. In other words, God is the source of all reality and all truth. Without God, there's no reality. So when we come to these kinds of statements, we have to let go of our conceptions. And we have to embrace God's conceptions. We have to think the way that God wants us to think. 
Give an example. You go to, to Luke's Gospel, chapter 1. So the angel Gabriel comes to Zacharias, right? And the angel Gabriel says to him, you and your wife can have a son. And, 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 and Zacharias responds to him and says, but we're both old, advanced in years. There's no way my wife's barren. We're not going to have a kid. His concept of reality was not God's concept of reality. He's sitting there saying, here's reality. My wife and I are really old. We're well long in years. My wife is barren. She can't have a baby. We've tried for years. It's not possible. God says, yeah, but you don't have my concept of reality. And God's saying, I determine what's real, not you. But see, we do that. How many times do we do that in life? We see something happening in our life, or something going on, or we're facing something, and we view it from our concept of what we think is, rather than see it through the eyes of God. So here's another example. Mary, right? So the angel Gabriel comes to Mary and says to Mary, she says, you're going to have a son. She doesn't doubt him. She just asks, okay, how's this going to happen? Because I've never been with a man. I'm a virgin. It's not pot, right? So the angel Gabriel says, the Holy Spirit's going to come upon you. You're going to conceive a child in your womb. And so then when she encounters, right, Elizabeth, after embracing and said, let it be done to me as you will, she goes and sees Elizabeth and Elizabeth praises her because she believed what the Lord had said to her. She embraced God's concept of reality. If God says you're going to have a child even though you're a virgin and it's completely impossible to our mindset, she was willing to embrace it because she accepted it in light of the fact of who God is. He is the determiner of reality. So when we come to these statements, don't brush them off because they make you afraid. And if you read them and you go, that just can't be real. If God says it's real, it's real. In other words, when we look at the divining of our privileges, what Christ is, we share in that. If He is Son, we are sons and daughters. If He is an heir, we are fellow heirs. And His Spirit affirms to our spirit that we are fellow heirs. That's the truth. If God says that He raised Him up and us up with Him, going back to the times when He walked on this earth, if we were crucified with Him, raised up with Him, seated with Him, all that is true may not fit our concept of reality, but it's the truth and it's God's concept of reality. We need to embrace that. It describes our possessions, what He has, we share in that. So if you go to chapter 1. So Paul talks about chapter 1, verse 19. He says, and what is the surpassing greatness of His power? So everything in this prayer is about, I want you to understand what is His, okay? So even though he's talked about the things that happened to us, it's his calling, verse 18, it's his inheritance, right? And then it's his power. And I want you to understand these things. And he says, notice the greatness of his power, verse 19, toward us who believe. It is towards us. It is this power that is available to us. What power is it? These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him up from the dead and seated him in at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion. There's no one higher than Christ, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but in the age to come. And he put all things in subjection under his feet, and he gave him as head over all things to who? The church. To us. He says, I exercised this power in him. I exalted him above everything else that can exist, does exist, will ever exist. He is in the highest place possible. There is no place higher than the right hand of God the Father. He is seated there, and I have placed him over all these things, and I have given him his head over the church. I have given him to you for our benefit. What he has we share in. So when we walk out into the world, face the world knowing that He sits and rules over everything in this world, He controls it all, and because of that, we share in that sovereignty. We share in what He has and what He exercises over those things. Not only that, but it de then it determines our practice. What He does, we do. So this is the phrase, in the sphere of Christ, it, it's, a, it's a rather pregnant phrase. There's a lot of stuff involved in it. Amazing truth, but see it for all that it is, especially as we walk through this letter and see it as a whole. So I wanted to talk about this, this thought in a little bit bigger scope. 
the union of our life in Christ ideally established in the Council of Redemption. So we'll look at several points, and these you have in your notes, so you can just follow with me and we'll walk through this and talk about it. The union of life in Christ ideally established in the Council of Redemption. This is looking at eternity past. This is looking at God's plan and purpose. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 11, it says, This is in accordance with the eternal purpose which he literally created in Christ Jesus our Lord. So God has this eternal purpose, eternity past, stretching from all of eternity to all of eternity. That embraces time and space and everything that happens in it. God has this redemptive plan, and it's an eternal plan. And when we talk about union with Christ, it's, such a, it's a broad term, and it's it captures so much stuff in it. But just simply to say, when we're talking about union with Christ, it's a way of trying to express the intertwining of ourselves and our life with Christ. We are bound together with Him. But the reality of this is binding together with Him didn't just happen at our conversion. It happened from all of eternity. In other words, in eternity past, when God designed this redemptive plan, He bound us together with Christ. We saw this if you look at chapter 1. In verse 4, he says, Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. The juxtaposition in the Greek text, we have he, us, in him. We see God the Father taking us and putting us together with Christ in this relationship in eternity past. And it reaches all the way into eternity future and it involves everything that happens in time and space. And he moves to deal with that in chapter 1, verse 5, or, or verse 6 and 7, when he talks about the issue of the redemption that we now have. So in the eternal divine council of peace, Christ, God's Son, voluntarily took upon Himself to be the head and surety of the elect, destined to constitute the new humanity. In, from all of eternity, the Son, when in the divine council, the triune Godhead, when God designed this plan, created this plan before He created the universe, the Son already voluntarily embraced His role in all of this as head and surety of what was to come for us as the elect. And Ephesians, while well, we mention this new humanity, because in Ephesians, that's what he's doing. He's establishing a new humanity, a new society. We are a new man, he says in chapter 3. We are a new man in Christ. Or, and actually, at the end of chapter 2. And chapter 2, verses 11 and following, is really at the heart of the letter. Although unity is that overriding theme that runs all the way through here, at the heart of the letters, chapter 2, verses 11 and following, where he talks about the fact that he's making the two into one new man. This is what Christ is doing. It is a new humanity. It's not the best of the Jew and the best of the Gentile or the pagan. No, it's a completely new man. And so this is the idea, but it started in eternity past. In God's redemptive plan, the Son voluntarily took this upon Himself. And just think about all the implications, the theological implications that come of that. Justification by faith, all of that. All of this stuff was established from all of eternity. It didn't just come into existence in time and space. There was already an objective reality which this involved. So in the eternal divine council of peace, Christ God the Son voluntarily took upon Himself to establish their righteousness before God by paying the penalty for their sin and by rendering perfect obedience to the law and thus securing their right to everlasting life. Talking about us. So he voluntarily, in eternity past, took them upon himself. And so when we talk about the suffering of Christ, it didn't just start with the beatings and the cross. It started in the fact that he took on human nature. He voluntarily came down and took upon himself flesh. He took on human nature. He lived as man among men. That's when his suffering started. And it lasted his whole life. The beatings and the cross were just the climax of it all. But he voluntarily took this from all of eternity so that we could have the everlasting life that we receive through faith in Him.
the union of life objectively realized in Christ in eternity then. So if it's a part of this great redemptive plan, then we realize that it's rooted in eternity past. This is where Paul starts off in chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. He chose us. How did he do this? He did this by predestining us to adoption as sons. This is an eternal plan. Happened eternity past. So here's what's interesting. Unfortunately, that, that many doctrines that deal with the union with Christ, they start with an anthropological focus. In other words, their focus is on time and space, and really it's when we became believers. That's their focus. So many theologies, when they talk about our union with Christ, it starts for them, and their discussion is when we accepted Christ as our Lord and Savior. Whenever that was, that's when they start to see this union happen. We receive Christ as our Lord and Savior. We're bound together with Him. That's when the relationship starts. And that's where they start then talking about what comes of that. The unfortunate thing is, is this fails to see the reality of what God has done. In other words, in your notes you see there, but this fails to do full justice to the truth of union of life in Christ since it loses sight of the eternal basis of the union and of its objective realization in Christ and deals exclusively with the subjective realization of it in our lives and even so only with our personal conscious entrance into this union. In other words, what they're saying is that the only time that we really understand this union with Christ and we really get it as a reality is when we accept Christ our Lord and Savior. So taking it down into my own life. When I was seven years old in Sunday school, when I accepted Christ as my Lord and Savior, that's when my union with Him began. That's not true. That's not true. My union began with Christ before I was even conceived. My union with Christ began before I was even born. My union with Christ began before the world was even created, before there was an Adam and an Eve. Paul says in 1.4 that He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world. That's when my union with Christ began. It was an objective reality. It became a subjective reality when I was seven years old in Sunday school class. For Paul, it became a subjective reality when he was on the road to Damascus and he fell down before the Lord and he was saved. But it was an objective reality in the plan of God. In the mind of God, it was already so. Before I even experienced it, before Paul even experienced it, before you even experienced it. In other words, God's going to enact His eternal plan in your life when it's His and His timing. We have to remember that. We witness to friends and relatives, and we want them to be saved. We have a zeal to see them saved. But understand, God's going to do it in His time, if He's going to do it at all. And they could be 80 when He finally calls them efficaciously unto salvation. But it's in His timing. We have to understand, where our story began, it began before we were ever here. Our story began in eternity. In other words, reality isn't really just because I experience it. This is what the world says. Reality is only what you can taste, touch, smell, and it only is what you experience. That's reality. So they would suggest there's no objective reality. The problem is the Bible says otherwise. There is objective reality. If God chose me in Christ before the foundation of the world, that's objective reality. In the mind of God, it was already so. Because God's plan is an eternal plan. It's not controlled by time and space. So when God looks at our life, He sees it in the eternal now. From, from eternity past to eternity future and everything happens in time, He sees it as a simultaneous whole, as an eternal now. This is what's so amazing about our life. We have no idea what's going to happen tomorrow. We plan and think we do, but we have no idea what's going to happen tomorrow. We've got a pretty good guess at it. God knows everything that's going to happen tomorrow. Every little thing. He's already designed it. He's already planned it all. The problem is, is that the world's way of thinking infiltrates us, and we embrace the world's idea of reality, and usually this is virtual reality. It's not even real. Because they look at the world without God in it. That's not reality. It's all virtual. They deceive themselves. They say this is true and this is not true. This is real. This is not real. So in other words, the world's idea of reality, this is, is not God's idea of real reality. And that's what we must embrace. If God says, I chose you in eternity past, and that's real, 
It's just as real as the day that I accepted Christ as my Lord and Savior in the mind of God. Therefore, we need to consider this truth theologically, not anthropologically. We don't see it from man's perspective. We see it from God's perspective. And we need to consider this truth from a theocentric perspective rather than anthropocentric. And we can see it as a theoanthropic perspective, right, from, from a God-man perspective, but we cannot see it from just merely man's point of view. And much of these things, we sort of set them aside and we say, okay, well, I just don't want to go there or I don't want to think about this. These things are written down for us to know. Paul prays that we would have this knowledge of God and what he did, right? So we need to know these things. And they help us because they help us look at life as it really is. Not as we think it is, but as we know it is because we see it through God's eyes. So our being in the sphere of Christ and all that that entails is rooted not in time, but in eternity. The truth and reality of it is, is rooted in eternal triune Godhead. This is eternal security. <laughs> this is assurance. Yes, I evaluate my life to see if I'm in the faith in that, and we need to always check ourselves, but at the same time, I, I don't fear, though, because I know that I'm truly His. And ultimately it rests in Him. So the union of life then in Christ, subjectively realized by the operation of the Holy Spirit in time and space, talked about the characteristics of this union that we have. Several things we need to know. At first it's an organic union. We see this coming into Ephesians. The organic character of this union is seen in the fact that Christ and believers form one body. And we'll get into these truths as we walk through this letter. But essentially, he develops this in chapter 1. He's going to carry it into the rest of the letters. He talks about the fact that we have this organic union with Christ. We're bound together with Him. The, the greatest picture is in John's Gospel. When in chapter 15, he talks about the vine and the branches. Right? If you go look out in a vine, you see these branches stemming off of the vine, it grounded into that vine. They, they, they're fruitful, they flourish, they thrive because they're in that vine, those branches are. They're a part of that. It's a truth for you and I with Christ. We are so intertwined with Him. He is our life. He lives in us. He lives through us. He works through us. He animates us. When he talks about in chapter 4, and he talks about the ministry of the church, he's going to talk about the fact that it is from him, verse 16 of chapter 4, it is from whom this whole body is being fitted and held together, and it is supplying its need. As he flows from the head down through us, as we touch each other's lives, he is working through us, touching the lives of other people in the body of Christ, and we are growing together. But he's doing it in and through us. There is a vital union that exists. That's why he uses expressions like body, right? If I take my arm off from the rest of the body, I cut off and lay it on the floor, what's going to happen to it? It dies. It's got no life in it. It can't operate by itself. The same thing is true about you and I in our relationship with Christ. That means that when we walk into everyday life, we need to be constantly yielding to him, watching it and just praying and and yielding to his working in and through our life. What will you do through us? What do you want to do through me? How do you want me to respond to this situation? How do you want me to speak these words to this person? What do you want me to do? How do you want me to serve? Our whole day should be starting to think this way in relation to Christ and what happens around us. It isn't just about a Sunday thing. It's an everyday thing. He's the head, we're the body, and everything flows from Him in and through us and out to others. It's the great thing about being able to just talk to the Lord whenever. And I, and I love it. You, just, you can just, and it doesn't have to be some profound prayer. We come into a situation and someone asks you a question, you just whisper, Lord, help me to answer. And then just yield to Him and let Him work through you and answer. It's that simple. But think about the course of our day, how, how often we just, we do it without thinking that way, or without yielding that way. He truly is head, we truly are his body, we are his arms and legs in the world doing ministry. So we should be constantly tapping into 
where do you want us to go, right? If I think I want to get up and go in the other room, my head tells my body, my body gets up and goes, right? The head directs. Not only that, but it's a vital union. It is none other than the life of Christ that indwells and animates us. By it, Christ becomes the formative principle of our life, and He leads us in a Godward direction. It's the truth. His life is in us. He is in us. He directs us and animates us. And we can resist that because it's a relationship, right? That's the thing about it. We can, it's like the Holy Spirit. We can quench the Holy Spirit, right? We can grieve the Holy Spirit. We can do similar things. We're talking about our relationship with Christ. It's a relationship. So we're constantly having to cultivate that. It is a union mediated by the Holy Spirit. In other words, through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us, He unites us to Christ and knits us together in a holy unity. We'll see this as we walk through this letter. Again, this is just big picture of Ephesians, some things I want you to contemplate as we walk through this letter and see these truths, but this is so. The Holy Spirit applies these things to our life and unites us together. So when it comes to the issue of unity in chapter 4, verse 3, he says, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace, it is that which he produces in us. Well, how do we, how do we maintain that? Verse 2, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing forbearance for one another, bearing up under one another in love. This is how we flush that out. We have the theological reasoning for why we do these things. It's the thing that Paul was trying to get the church of Corinth to understand. They were acting like fleshly people. They were acting like mere human beings. He's saying, no, you're supernatural. Spirit of God is in you. Right? You're the holy temple because he dwells in you. Then act like that. It's a union that implies reciprocal action. In other words, the initial act is that of Christ, who unites us to himself by regenerating us and thus producing faith in us. This is what he does in us. At the same time, the believer also unites himself to Christ by a conscious act of faith and continues that union under the influence of the Holy Spirit by constant exercise of faith. It takes, and we can't just lay there in our bed and say, okay, Christ, move me, right? We get up and go. And we're constantly exercising our faith and living in the light of the fact that He is the head and He is the life in us and He is directing us. We constantly have to trust Him, right? And when He, and when he prompts your heart to go do something, trust that He will provide for you to do what He wants you to do. There's so many times you talk to believers and they, they, they say, well, I'd really like to do this ministry and it's, it's on my heart to go do that, but I'm afraid if I just, you know, this is going to happen or that's going to Just do it. Just go. Right? Just go. Whatever comes. You watch Paul in Acts and he was compelled in the Holy Spirit that he was going to go off to Jerusalem, right? And he was being tried, people were trying to stop him all the way, even by having Revelation saying, this is what's going to happen if you go there. And he says, but I got to go anyway. Because he was compelled in the Spirit to go. And then you just keep trusting and you keep exercising that faith. It's a relationship. You constantly have to be cultivating it. He works, but we must also work in that. It's a personal union. Every believer is personally united to Christ directly to Him. This isn't just a corporate thing. It's a personal thing. Each one of us are. That means that it comes with personal responsibility to maintain this union with Christ. It's not merely just when we get together as a body of believers and that's when we're in this union with Christ. No, it's on an individual level. Each of our lives... We are connected with Christ. It's a thing. When we get together, yeah, we're the church who meets here in this building. But when we go to our homes, we're still the church. Nowhere in the Bible is the church ever referred to as a building. It's always the people. Where you go, the church is. Where you are, Christ is. Right? And so we are that fragrant aroma Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians. We are the fragrant aroma of Christ. Wherever we go, people should just inhale and breathe in Christ. But this is the reality for each one of us. We don't have to be around other believers for this to be so. It is for you and I. It's the beauty of it. Every sinner who is regenerated is directly connected with Christ and receives his life from him. 
constantly in the Bible always emphasizes the bond with Christ that we have over and over. 1 Corinthians 12, it's interesting because, you know, he, Paul talks about the fact that Christ is the head and we're the body. It's interesting that he speaks of both of them together and he refers to them as the Christ. We're that so bound together with Christ that he could refer to the head and the body collectively as the Christ. And sometimes we read something like that and just think that's kind of blasphemous. And I've said that to people where they like cite that passage and they just kind of go, I, and immediately just blow it off. Like, I don't want to think that's just something's wrong with that. Again, that's our conception of reality, not God's conception of reality. God says, you're so intimately bound together with Christ that he can refer to us collectively as the Christ. Now, that doesn't mean I go around telling everybody that, you know, I am Jesus Christ and I, you know, died for your sins. No, right? That's the mystics. They went crazy with this. But understand at the same time, though, how intimately united we are with Christ, that our regenerated soul is bound together with him. Eternally so. Eternally so. And no one can take that from you. No one can. Paul says in Colossians chapter 3, that he talks about the fact that our, our life is hidden with Christ in God. No man can take that from you. It is a transforming union that takes place. In your notes, by this union, believers are changed into the image of Christ according to his human nature. He walked a sinless man. He is producing a new humanity. So he had to come in flesh, in blood, right? For us to be the new man here on earth as well and to live out this life. So what Christ affects in his people is in a sense a replica or reproduction of what took place with him. This is the beauty of the obedience of Christ. We realize that we could never walk in that obedience because he did, we can and will nor even objectively, but it also is in the subjective sense that they suffer, they bear the cross, are crucified, died, and are raised in newness of life with Christ. Just as it happened to him, Paul says it happened to us. His resurrection was our resurrection. It's the same resurrection life. It's a crazy thought. But that's God's conception of reality, not ours. So, we'll end with that. We'll come back next week and we'll look more at redemption and what that entails for us and talk about the doctrine of atonement a little bit more. But hopefully, as you keep reading through Ephesians, have this big picture in mind and these truths in mind as you read through this letter. It's so important. Again, over 30 times we have this in Christ, in Him, in whom, runs through this letter. It's there for a reason. It's crucial for us to understand. And we won't get it all now, but we need to strive to understand, at least in the smallest ways, what these things are, right? Because they should affect how we live our life.